Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Milwee, uh, Trinity, Alabama, Mount View Baptist Church. I want to uh, continue our study today on Pathway uh, to Maturity. And today I want to talk about uh, the important subject of trust. Uh, learning to trust God. In other words, uh, taking our cares to Him and actually leaving them there. Uh, I think it's a very valuable lesson, especially uh, during this time that we're all... Uh, going through uh, right now is a time of, of anxiety, a time of uncertainty, a time of fear. And so um, uh, today's lesson will help us, I think, to uh, face what we're facing uh, in our world today uh, with confidence, uh, knowing that uh, the Lord is in control. So uh, having said all that, uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. And uh, let's begin by saying this. The objective of our lesson today is to help us understand the importance of placing our full trust and confidence uh, in the Lord. Uh, so what does trusting God uh, look like? Well, uh, I believe it means that I've come to realize that uh, God's grace, uh, his, his unmerited favor, His unconditional love, well, it's all that I need. Uh, it is sufficient. It, it, it will carry me through. And, and so um, I don't think I've shared with you already, but uh, let me uh, uh, begin today. I want to I begin by using an illustration from uh, uh, probably what's one of my favorite Christian books. Uh, I was introduced to this book a few years ago, and, and it's just really come to mean a lot to me. I, I actually try to read it once a year. Uh, it's written by uh, Hannah Whitall Smith. Uh, she was a Quaker lady who lived back in the 1800s, and the name of the book is uh, The Christian Secret to a Happy Life. Uh, the Christian Secret of a Happy Life. And um, if you, uh, you know, that title can be deceptive because you'd think somebody that wrote that book would have had a carefree life. But if you read the biography of uh, Hannah Whittall Smith, you, you'll discover that she went through a lot of difficulty and a lot of hardship uh, in, in her life. And um, in spite of all that, uh, she is able to keep a, a positive attitude. So, uh, she tells this story, though, that I think helps to illustrate uh, what we're talking about when, when I say trust. Uh, she says once uh, she had a grievous problem uh, that she couldn't resolve, so she went to a lady who she considered to be deeply spiritual. And she just poured out her problems uh, to her, and, and she said the lady listened patiently, um, listen, you know, let her completely finish all that she was uh, sharing, and she said that she had waited expectantly, you know, for, for some sympathy and for some consideration. But after she finished sharing all these struggles, all these problems, the lady said, yes, all you say may be very true, but then in spite of it all, there is God. Well, Hannah was a little perplexed uh, by that answer. She tried to make the woman understand that she really did have, you know, a problem. But after listening much more, uh, the lady again just virtually dismissed everything that Hannah had said. And she said, oh, yes, I understand. But then as I tell you, there is God. Well, no matter how hard she tried, uh, Hannah couldn't get the lady to say anything else, and she left a little disappointed. She returned a few days later, went through the same thing again, and every time uh, the lady gave the same answer. But Hannah says, at last, because the woman said it so often and seemed so sure, I began to dimly wonder whether, after all, God might be enough for my need. She says, overwhelming and as peculiar as I felt it would be, from wondering, I came gradually to believing that being my creator and redeemer, he must be enough. She says, at last, a conviction burst upon me that he really was enough. And my eyes were open to the fact of the absolute and utter all sufficiency of God. Well, that's what we want to talk about uh, today, that no matter what we're facing in life, God is enough as we uh, trust Him. So, at weak and vulnerable times in our life, God gives us the opportunity to learn to trust. 
The passage that comes to mind when I think of trust uh, is the familiar and very beloved passage from Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 and 6. Uh, many of you can probably quote it with me. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. I wanted to begin here uh, today because uh, uh, these are, as I said, are some of the most beloved uh, verses in Scripture. These verses encourage wholehearted trust in the Lord. Uh, in, in fact, these verses out and out tell us to trust in the Lord even when you don't understand what's happening. We to acknowledge God in everything and not to lean on our own understanding. And as we do this, the Bible says that God will make our path straight, or your translation might say will direct your path. So, isn't it good that God's ways are higher than our ways? We can be assured that God has a plan for us, and it's much better than anything that we can come up with. In fact, I've asked a number of people who are facing death uh, to tell me the passage that, you know, they're really holding on to the most. And, and inevitably, this is one of the passages that always comes to mind. Therefore, this passage is not teaching that nothing bad will ever happen to you. It tells you that God will be with you through it all. I'm sure you've all seen this uh, little diagram. I've seen several memes about it on the internet. And it says, you know, this is what I thought my life was going to be like. Okay? That's how I thought it was going to go. But this is how it really went. <laughs> uh, can you relate to that? Uh, a few years ago, I was talking with a church member that was in the hospital. And it was the afternoon after she met with the doctors uh, to tell them that she did not want any heroic efforts made uh, to prolong her life. And as we were talking, she basically quoted this verse to me, and then she said, God sees everything, and God knows better than I do how my death will affect everyone around me. I don't want to do anything to disrupt God's timing because my life is in His hands. She felt strongly that God's will for her would be better than anything that she and the doctors could come up with. And I got to tell you, I admired that lady for her faith. Her comments remind us that we will never face a situation where God is not sufficient to see us through. In other words, you'll never face a crisis that God is not able uh, to help you overcome it. God will never ask you to do something that he hasn't already given you the ability to do. Because again, God is our sufficiency. God has already provided everything we need uh, to live for him. This is why I also draw strength from the words of Isaiah, where he says in Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. Now, let me repeat that. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. My friend Greg is super smart. He's got his PhD and all that kind of stuff. He wrote a commentary on Isaiah. And on this passage, this is what he said. He said, this promise is profound. The mind in its vast depth, both what is conscious and what is unconscious, will be sustained in absolute peace or put better, complete order with the emotions and decisions, making faculties fully alive and free of all corruption as long as we trust in God. When we put our thinking in God's hands to organize what chaos brought to it by sin, we're not ruled by our emotions, and yet we can experience them just as God intended when he gave them to us. Not only that, our ability to think and clearly understand what we face is purified and made right. So what does it mean to have your mind stayed on God? It means to be fixed in other words, my mind is fixed upon God because I trust in Him. And as a result of this trust, the Bible says, I have perfect peace. It goes back to uh, the opening illustration that Hannah shared with us. In spite of everything that's going on around me, there is God. I think that's a word we really need to hear right now. 
Because if you just watch television, if you just see all the news and you see all this that's going on around us, man, it's scary. But the Bible is clearly teaching that no matter what's happening around us, God is still uh, in control. I have peace because I have placed my life in his hands. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, Warren Wiersbe, in one of his commentaries, well, his commentary on Isaiah, he says that uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 9, is based upon Isaiah 26, 3. So we just uh, talked about uh, Isaiah 26, 3. His mind is, he, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. So now let's look at this passage in Philippians. Philippians 4, beginning verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I preached through the book of uh, Philippians uh, earlier this year. And when I got to this passage, I broke it down into three main points. Uh, so the three practical steps to uh, keeping your mind in, in perfect peace and, 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 and trusting in the Lord uh, is uh, take everything to God in prayer, deliberately fill your mind with good thoughts, and put into practice what you have seen and heard. So let's take a couple of minutes and talk about these. Number one, take everything to God in prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the text says, the peace that comes from God is beyond what anything we can understand or even comprehend. It surpasses understanding. The word surpasses means it rises above or it excels. In other words, the peace of God is different from other kinds of peace. It's a peace that's overflowing out of our personal relationship with him. It's dependent upon that relationship, not upon our circumstances. So notice what Paul does here. He says that God's peace is like a fortress that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So, so notice that this peace is specifically found in Christ Jesus. This is that fortress of peace that guards our heart and our mind. In fact, verse 7 begins with the little Greek conjunction, chi, translated as and. So this indicates that verse 7 is result of what is commanded in verse 6. So God's peace comes to us as we do two things. First, when we bring all of our requests to God, nothing is too insignificant to pray for. And then number two, as every request is laced with thanksgiving. Therefore, we pray with confidence knowing that God is going to answer in a way that's in our best interest. He knows what's best for us and he will answer accordingly. We can trust in his providence and provision for our lives. We can take our cares and our worries and our anxieties and our concerns to the throne of grace and trust him for the answer. So that's the first step to keeping our mind stayed or fixed on God. The second is to de deliberately fill your mind with good things. Look at verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things we got to be careful what we let into our mind. Uh, we talked about that yesterday when, when we talked about personal purity. Verse 7 says that the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. But now verse 8 helps us to see that we have to do our part. We play our part by being careful about what we think about, about what we dwell on. Uh, we're, we're to think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Uh, we're taught in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and I talked about this yesterday, to take every thought captive for Christ. So we, we replace our, our bad thoughts with better thoughts, such as whatever is true, what's honorable, what's just, what's right. Uh, as much as anything, um, this is what some psychologists call a positive self-talk. 
And there's nothing weird or unscriptural about it. I mean, it's right here in the Bible. God knows that Satan is the great deceiver. And if he can get you to worry, if he can get you to fill your mind with bad things, if he can get you to be filled with anxiety instead of trust, then he's won half the battle. You know, I said the other day when I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, the way you can tell if it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you as opposed to uh, the devil is the Holy Spirit's always going to point you toward Christ. He's always going to build you up. He's always going to encourage you to seek, uh, you know, repentance and to do what's right. While the, the devil's going to fill you with anxiety and fear and, and all that. Listen, worry is the opposite of trust. As somebody said, worrying won't stop the bad stuff from happening. It'll just keep you from enjoying the good. <laughs> so learn to trust. So take everything to God in prayer. Fill your mind with good thoughts. And now number three, practice these things. Put them into practice. Uh, look at verse nine. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now you, you might want to circle those words practice these things right there in your Bible. Or maybe your translation just simply says, do these things. In fact, I think we can summarize uh, these verses by saying, right praying plus right thinking equals right living. Let me repeat that. Right praying plus right thinking equals right living. In other words, we can come and sit through Bible study after Bible study, sermon after sermon, but if we never put into practice what we're learning, then it's not helping us. Uh, Paul says that what you have learned and received and heard in me, practice these things. In other words, just do it, try it, live it, and if you will, the peace of God will be with you. Now, do you think that Paul was a man that knew what he was talking about? I mean, he wrote this book from prison. He is a man that lived through years of anxiety and stress, I mean on a daily basis. In 2 Corinthians 11, we get a little sense of some of the things he lived through. It says, uh, he's, he writes, uh, but whatever else uh, anyone dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are the Hebrews, so am I. Are the Israelites, so am I. Are the offspring of Abraham, so am I. Are the servants of Christ, I'm a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from all other things, there's the daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all the churches. So Paul knew a little bit about stress and anxiety. And he says, in our text today, I taught you these things Put them into practice. Put into practice what you've learned and received. You've heard these things from me. You've seen them at work in my life. He's basically saying, and listen, he says, I'm a man that knows what he's talking about. And if you'll do these things, if you'll practice these things, then the peace of God will be with you. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. There are actually many times in Proverbs uh, where Solomon says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We also uh, find uh, this uh, same admonition a number of times from David in the book of Psalm. I like what um, one author said. He said, the fear of the Lord is not the fear that God might hurt us, but rather the fear that we might hurt him. Again, fears that used here means a loving reverence toward God and his word. So the wise person will learn to fear the Lord, but the fool will despise wisdom and discipline. So we get to make a choice today. Are we going to listen to and adhere to and trust the words found in the Bible, or are we going to despise and reject them? Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, says it is imperative to do the former and, and foolish to do the latter. So I want to invite you to listen to 2 Corinthians 12, 9 from the Amplified Bible. I like this particular translation of this verse because it paints a beautiful word portrait for us of what God wants to do for us as we face difficult situations. So 2 Corinthians 12, 9 from the Amplified Bible. 
But he said to me, My grace, my favor and loving kindness and mercy, is enough for you, sufficient against any danger, and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glory in my weaknesses and infirmities that the strength and power of Christ the Messiah may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell upon me. Now, I love this word picture. I love thinking about Jesus pitching his tent over and dwelling among us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about that and the love and protection it gives me, that he is shielding me, he is watching over me, he is keeping me from trouble and difficulty, uh, you know, hard times are going to come. But I can make it through those times if I will only trust him. Well, let me close today with a couple of illustrations that might help you. Uh, the first one, again, from Hannah Smith in her book, she says, I knew a lady who had a heavy temporal burden. It took away her sleep and her appetite, and there was the danger of her health breaking down over it. She said, one day when it seemed especially heavy, she noticed laying on the table near her a, a little track entitled Hannah's Faith. Well, attracted by the title, she picked it up and began to read it. It was a story of a poor woman who had been carried triumphantly through a life of unusual sorrow. She was given the history of her life to a kind visitor on one occasion. And at the close, the, the, vis, the visitor said with feeling, Oh, Hannah, I don't see how you could bear so much sorrow. Her quick reply was, Well, I didn't bear it. The Lord bore it for me. Well, yes, said the visitor, that's the right way. We must take our troubles to the Lord. Yes, uh, Hannah replied, but we must do more than that. We must leave them there. Now listen very carefully to what she says. Most people take their birds to him, but they bring them away with them again and are just as worried and unhappy as ever. But I take mine and I leave them with him, and I come away and forget them. If the worry comes back, I take it to him again, and I do this over and over until at last I forget I have any worries, and I am at perfect peace. I love that advice. Uh, it's so practical. And it's exactly what God is encouraging us to do today. We're to take our cares and our concerns and our burdens to the Lord and we're to leave them there. In other words, we're to trust Him that He is in control and that and, and, and He's going to take care of us. But the thought occurred to me, you know, maybe some of you can't relate to a woman from the 1800s. So let me share a quote uh, from a young lady that uh, grew up in one of the churches where I was the pastor, and, and she shared this on Facebook about a year ago. She's a young, uh, single mother, and she said, In an effort to stay truthful and selfly honest, I'll let you in on a milestone. I find joy in small things. They usually come in the form of being able to supply uh, my son with clothes, etc. I'm continually blessed that the Lord provides and lets me live within my means, which is an extremely hard task here in California. She lives in California. She was in one of the churches we, we pastored there. She said, I couldn't even imagine if I had more mouths to feed or provide for. So much respect for those doing it for three, four, and five, et cetera, your superheroes. But then she says this. She says, this is the longest I've stayed in one place. Almost four years. It's the longest that I haven't moved due to some financial reason. It's the longest I've been able to plant roots in my life. It's a season that now comes uh, with filling up my home, not selling off my stuff to provide. I'm in no way bragging, but more hum humbly hoping to encourage anyone who just left a horrible situation, whatever the situation, like I did four years ago, to start over life with only the clothes I owned and a baby. It is possible. With God comes peace, and with peace comes trust, and with trust comes hope in the smallest steps each one leading to a better thing. Trust in Him. It didn't happen overnight, and it's not finished. But I trust in His provision. It's the small things, like being able to decorate a spot for Easter. I love there where she says, With God comes peace, with peace comes trust, 
and with trust comes hope in the smallest steps, each one leading to a better thing. Trust in Him. It didn't happen overnight, and it's not finished, but I trust in His provision. Or, as Isaiah said to us earlier, you keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon you because He trusts in you. Let me encourage you during these uh, hard and difficult days to keep your mind on the Lord and live in perfect peace because you trust in Him. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching today.